Welcome to the Pass Forward China General Channel of Commerce USA 2021st Annual Business Survey Report on Chinese Enterprises in the U.S. Launch Event. My name is Sherry Q, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of CGCC. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. If you are not familiar with CGCC, we are an independent, non-partisan, non-governmental chamber of commerce. We provide a broad range of programs, services, and resources to over a thousand multinational corporate members. We are so excited today to share with you the key findings and the trends, as well as insights into the overall business sentiment of Chinese companies in the U.S. from survey report. Since 2014, the annual business survey report has been the flagship project of CGCC and the CGCC Foundation. The eighth year of this data-driven and case-focused research project. A special thanks to our partner this year, EY America, and our good friend and longtime supporter at EY, Ms. Shang Zhang, and her great team. We also want to give a quick shout out to all the companies who fell out to the survey report and participated in the interviews this year. Today, we are very pleased to be joined by a group of incredible leaders and experts. CCCC Vice Chairman Xiao Yuqiang, also the Chairman of US Management Committee ICBC, will give open remarks. Ms. Zhao's remarks will be followed by a presentation from Abby Lee, Director of Research at CDCC. Our program will also feature a dialogue on trust building and the branding between Mr. Richard Atman, CEO of Atman, one of the largest PR firm in the world and a company that has been in China for 30 years. And also Mr. Lin Huaguan, CEO of Search Energy America. Search Energy is one of the only two international sponsored oil companies in the top 20, in the top 20 oil producers in Texas. And he has also got recognized for both the best place to work and the fastest growing middle market 50 by Houston Business Journal in 2020. There will be a brief Q&A session after dialogue. Ms. Zhong Zhang will close the program for us for today. A few housekeeping rules before we start. Today's program will be recorded and live streamed on CGCC LinkedIn page. The video recording will be made available on CGCC YouTube channel as well. The views and opinions expressed by our guests are theirs alone and do not necessarily represent the official view or positions of the institutions they work for. Feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A box located on the bottom of your screen throughout the event. Our speakers will try their best to address these questions during the session. Now, without further ado, let's welcome our CGCC Vice Chairman, Mr. Xiao. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sherry. Um, dear Chairman Xi, um, uh, CGCC members, friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. So uh, this is uh, definitely a pleasure for me to introduce the survey. And this afternoon, um, uh, I will echo my uh, colleagues, uh, Sherry Thai mentioned that um, uh, we would like to appreciate the uh, support from Ernest Young, uh, from all the members that have been able to participate uh, this survey. And also, uh, uh, I, I want to appreciate the DP uh, paying the effort to, uh, you know, uh, finalize this survey. This is a very uh, interesting rating. So uh, as uh, uh, Sarah mentioned, this is the eighth uh, consecutive year uh, for CDCC uh, successfully uh, conduct this uh, annual business survey on Chinese enterprises in the United States. Um, uh, I believe um, um, all of you will definitely enjoy reading this survey uh, as much as I did. Um, uh, according to this year's survey, actually um, the tensions in the US China relations in recent years, alongside what the negative impact of COVID-19 uh, have impacted our members' view on the U.S. business environment and in fact, their uh, uh, confidence. Um, I, I do um, have the impression in one of the slides you're going to see later on that uh, what the uh, satisfactory level of the uh, enterprises here in the States actually diversified in last year compared to uh, previous years. So you will see um, the less, the, uh, less members taking that neutral position, the more uh, dissatisfied and also more satisfied as well. So you, I believe you'll find it very interesting. And um, yet within uh, this kind of the backdrop, um, it's also exciting to see 
um, um, the clear optimism and the resilience on the part of the Chinese com companies in this year. So, well, beyond the capital and the product and investment, the Chinese companies are seeking to strengthen their long-term uh, competitiveness in the U.S. market uh, through effective um, legal uh, complex, stronger brand recognition, uh, better use of the technology, and uh, streamlining the business operations. So uh, I strongly believe, and we do hope, that this survey will continue to act as a valuable tool uh, for both the uh, com business community and policymakers in the U.S. and China uh, that provided the important data and insight to help relevant stakeholders uh, better understand the position of a Chinese investment in the United States and support more uh, fully informed uh, data-driven decision makings. Uh, but that seeing, um, uh, while well, CGCC will definitely remain committed to carry on, uh, carry out the more constructive engagement and dialogues, so building bridge and um, achieving greater synergies to encourage better understanding and cooperation between the U.S. and the Chinese business community communities. Uh, uh, thank you all for joining us uh, for this uh, kickoff, uh, this launching of the survey this afternoon. But that's the opportunity back to Sari uh, for uh, next uh, uh, keynote speech uh, introduction. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Xiao. Now I will turn it over to Abby. Abby, it's all yours. Thank you, Sherry. Um, good afternoon and welcome, everyone. My name is Abby from China General Chamber of Commerce. Today, on behalf of CGCC and with special thanks to our partner EY, um, I would like to present you the updated findings of our 2021 annual business survey report on Chinese enterprises in the United States. Uh, as, the, um, as the most comprehensive uh, research focusing on existing Chinese companies in the US, our survey report helps them to timely update their uh, operational status uh, here in the U.S. and to reflect the issues they've encountered in the previous year. Well, meanwhile, as Chairman Xiao has mentioned, the report also helps the U.S. better understand the operational uh, status of Chinese enterprises and their positive impacts on and contributions to the U.S. economy and local communities. Um, as you can see, we've been conducting this annual, uh, annual research since 2014. From the um, pandemic-related disruptions to uncertainties with U.S.-China relations, 2020 was, was for sure an unusually volatile year. So uh, what was it like for Chinese companies to do business in the U.S. in the past year? Um, now in its eighth consecutive year, the 2021 survey report answered that question to a large extent by detailing the experiences and sentiments on nearly 200 Chinese companies operating here. For the demographic of our respondents, um, their U.S. operations span a broad range of 11 sectors, with their headquarters located in 40 states and subsidiary offices in facilities up all across the country. Um, throughout the past several years, our surveys have indicated that the evolution of U.S.-China relations have greatly affected corporate performance, investment strategies, and the overall priorities of the company's U.S. operations. So this year's survey in particular found that um, despite serious challenges in 2020, um, Chinese companies continue to view the U.S. market as an investment priority and remain committed to it for the long term. As the data shows, about 83% of respondents expect their new investments in the U.S. to either remain the same or to increase in 2021. While on the performance side, however, it may not be surprising that the revenue and the um, profitability suffered the most in 2020 as a result of a tougher business environment, primarily due to the COVID-19. Well, the pandemic has um, unfortunately accelerated the uh, respondents' perception of a slowly deteriorating U.S. business environment. As observed in the chart, that the level of satisfaction has been falling steadily in recent years. 
Um, such challenges from COVID, however, varied significantly across sectors. Um, while most of the effects were surely severe, the survey actually identified some positive impacts in specific uh, industries, especially healthcare and energy. It was um, partially due to the nature of the business, but more importantly, their responsiveness and flexibility to identify opportunities uh, during crisis. Another interesting observation from the survey indicated that despite the detrimental effects of the pandemic, uh, COVID-19 has actually catalyzed many companies to make positive and long-lasting changes. As we can see from the chart, 56% um, of respondents have enhanced their company's capabilities to identify and manage emerging risks, followed by increased investments in digital transformation product innovation and uh, customer engagement. So in a matter of fact, um, our companies have generally responded well to the pandemic's dual role as an amplifier of disrupted forces and accelerator um, of transformation. Next, please. Thank you. As Chinese companies adapt and uh, thrive in the US market, um, improving profitability and growing existing business remains as the primary objective for 73% of our respondents this year. Um, we also noticed that companies are additionally focusing on entering new markets, uh, obtaining brand recognition and uh, streamlining existing businesses in the year ahead. It has been, um, it has been widely acknowledged that the gap between how the U.S. market and the consumers um, perceive Chinese brands and how they view successful global brands still persist. The Chinese companies have been actively seeking opportunities lately to drive up recognition with a uh, sustainable, localized brand strategy and uh, persistent marketing investment. So as Sherry just introduced today, we're exceptionally honorable to have Mr. Adelman and Mr. Guan shed further light on brand and trust in the U.S. from different perspectives. So let's stay, stay tuned for their um, insights later on. And beyond, um, beyond the economic and uh, competitive and political challenges of operating in the U.S., our respondents highlighted that they are keenly focusing on regulatory uh, compliance. The survey saw a broadened focus on the U.S. federal, state, and other regulatory investigations, with more Chinese companies facing serious reviews and investigations related to information security in the past year. While well, surveyed companies continued investing in compliance, even with tougher economic conditions stemming from the pandemic. Specifically, as we can see, the number of companies choosing to strengthen internal systems and, and uh, um, compliance procedures remain high at 64%. Well, while looking ahead, Chinese companies expressed optimism about the direction of the U.S.-China bilateral relationship and economic cooperation with 39% of, uh, of respondents citing a moderate to, to a moderate to um, substantial improvement compared to 33% in 2020. So overall, business are, businesses are anticipating a more predictable and stable U.S. business environment. Well, at last, in reflecting on their experiences of uh, operating in the U.S. in recent years, Several company uh, executives identified some key points as suggestions to share with other Chinese companies, either um, existing ones or those who are considering um, investing in the U.S. So they suggest that companies should uh, stay focused on the, uh, on the area that you are familiar with the most and always do the feasibility analysis as comprehensive as possible. At the meantime, Leadership should keep um, monitoring the U.S. regulatory environment, watch for um, emerging risks, and be ready to respond anytime. They also highlight that the importance of leverage, um, of leveraging potential opportunities while monitoring the industry development, 
in multiple companies have mentioned that maintaining regular regulatory compliance should always be a, a top priority. Um, in order to thrive here in the uh, in the U.S. market, understanding this market and implement and implementing localized strategies is also crucial. Very importantly, engage with your local community and always be a proactive and responsible member. So, also as Chairman Xiao has mentioned, as U.S. and Chinese companies still hold deep commercial interests in each other's market. CGCC is still um, committed to uh, not only carrying out more constructive engagement and encouraging positive conversations, but also building bridges and achieving greater synergies and encourage better understanding and cooperation between the world's two largest economies. Uh, thank you all for your time and attention. The four uh, English, uh, English version survey reports will soon be accessible on our CGCC website. We look forward very much to our feedback and questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abby. Congratulations to you and the team again for the great work. Thank okay. You, now it's time for our feature the dialogue on trust building and branding. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Richard Atman and Mr. Guan Linghua. Hi, Mr. Atman. So glad to have you back again. Thank Your you. latest roundtable event you made was so well received by all members. Thank you so much, Sherry. So I'm looking forward. Great. So um, I'd like to introduce a new friend to you, a CGCC member, and also one of our celebrity CEO, Mr. Guan here. Ms. Guan, may we start with you first? Can you give us a brief introduction about Search Energy America? Okay, uh, thank you, Sherry. Uh, Search Energy is an oil producing company uh, headquartered in uh, Houston, Texas. And the company was founded by the capital from China in year 2015. Uh, since then, the company has grown from a small company to one of the largest oil producer in Texas, a state produced up about half of the U.S. Uh, crude oil production. And uh, just uh, this afternoon, we are celebrating Search Energy's first 100 million barrels oil equivalent production since 2016, the time Search Energy started to run a field called Moss Creek Field. Probably for the people that are not in oil and gas industry, I will use phone numbers to uh, tell the significance of the Search Energy's contribution to the U.S. economy. The first number is $1 billion. So that is the wealth created by the Search Energy company since the start of the operation of the oil field in 2016 to the end of uh, first quarter this year in the form of a uh, royalty payment, federal, state, and the local uh, taxes. And the second number I want to I want to use is one million dollar. So this year we have about three three hundred sixty five days. For the if we average this year's uh, kind of wealth created by the company, every day we will create more than one million dollar in the form of royalty and the taxes. And if we average to the number of uh, search employee and also the full-time contractors. So each person will create more than $2 million in the form of royalty and the taxes. And if we only count search energy's full-time employee, each full-time search employee will contribute $3 million in the form of royalty and the tax payment. So what does it mean? $3 million per full-time employee. So I will, here I will ask how many people in this group know the kind of average GDP, GDP per capita in the United States? Probably give a few seconds. And I give the number. It's that number is about $60,000. That is uh, GDP per capita in the United States. So $3 million, that's about 50 times of the GDP uh, uh, per capita in the United States. So we're proud of what we do here in the United States at the China Chinese owned enterprise. So that's uh, I want to talk about Search Energy America. 
Great, great. That's super imp imp uh, impressive. And um, I remember you mentioning in our prep call that you were um, greatly inspired by the trust building, you know, comments um, from Mr. Adamant. Do you mind to share a bit more about that with us? Uh, yes. So first, I want to uh, thank Richard for your uh, thought-provoking talk on uh, May 19th on the CGCC Leadership uh, Roundtable. I participated in that uh, event, and that's why I'm here today to talk about such energy's uh, story and my personal experience on trust building. So due to, due to the obvious reason uh, between China and the US, I choose to be quiet and uh, kept search energy under the radar of US business community in 2019 and 2020. But your uh, May 19th talk changed my mind. I still remember what you said. You are not going to benefit from uh, silence. So I'm thinking probably that's the time to uh, tell search energy's uh, story to the wider audience in the United States. So this is the actually the first time that I mentioned such energy's uh, contribution to the U.S. Uh, economy. And the uh, trust building actually is a topic that's very dear to my heart. And I learned the importance of uh, trust the hard way. So I gave some of my personal story. I came to the United States in year 2000. Before I came here, I thought I was a trustworthy people. But after I came to the United States, in the first three months in the United States, all my credit card application was rejected. So no credit card company willing to uh, approve me the lowest kind of uh, available credit to a kind of uh, a, a foreigner. So my first lesson to the United States, trust is the foundation in everything American do in life. So after that, I found if in order to survive uh, in the United States, I need to be a, 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 at least a trustworthy uh, people in order to live and survive in the United States. But this trust is something, it's not something you can take for granted. And it's sometimes it takes years, months or even years uh, to build. So uh, I give my personal example here too. I joined the third in uh, December 2018 and gave myself the only task in the first 12 months to build the trust between me and the third energy's most important stakeholder, that means the third uh, employee. And my second uh, 12 months, the task I gave to myself is to build the trust with the third energy's external stakeholder, that means uh, we we as a com private company here, we have a group of uh, 22 Wall Street Bank provide about a close to a billion dollar credit to search and a group of institutional stakeholders uh, hold $1.2 billion bond uh, issued by uh, search energy. I consider I was quite lucky to have 12 months in 2019 to build the trust between search employee and, uh, and myself. And then after 12 months, then the pandemic started. So 2020, uh, I had another lesson learned. So the once the trust had been built, it can pay special dividends. And this special dividend sometimes can probably uh, beyond your most wild imaginations. Here, I gave some, uh, probably just a three uh, examples. In for third energy, 2020 was a very trending year. Probably for the whole oil and gas industry, that is the most trending oil and gas uh, year. Uh, and the sometime in the last year, the oil price was even uh, ne negative, close to a negative $40. But uh, here I mentioned three achievements that right now, even today, I have difficulty to believe. So the first uh, achievement, last year was a pandemic year, but actually we achieved best safety record for the company. So consider all the change working at home and uh, we have changed a lot of way how we work in the office and uh, in, the, in the oil field, whether 
almost impossible for me to imagine that we could achieve by safety year in year 2000. And another one is the free cash flow year. Last year, I mentioned that oil price was even average WTI price was uh, lower than $40. So the last time the oil price lower than $40 was year 2003, was almost 20 years ago. So I could not believe that 2020, we achieved the, the free positive free cash flow. And uh, the last one is uh, just like uh, Sherry already mentioned, we are the only oil and gas company that are recognized by Houston Business Journal as the fast growth 50 company in Houston area across all the, uh, all the industries and the best place to work in the, in, in the oil and gas industry consider the negative oil price, all the downsizing, all the lower oil price. So I'm really kind of uh, very proud of uh, my company and also the trust that uh, we built in the year uh, 2019 and is still right now still have difficulty to believe. Yeah, this is a trust I built in 2019, paid some kind of special dividend that I, until today I have difficulty to believe. I have a few other one, but I don't want to, to talk just once mention three here. So. And also thank you, Richard, because of you I'm here today. Thank you so much, Mr. Glenn. Now, um, Mr. Adaman, you are the expert um, on trust building, and we all know about the trust barometer report. And yesterday, um, you just officially released an, an update report, right? Do you mind to spend a few minutes walk us through about your most recent findings? Yeah, thank you very much, Sherry. So there are some very important findings. It's, uh, it's on the Edelman website, but um, the story that we were told yesterday was about brands and trust. And so it's different from the uh, study that we did in May, which was about uh, corporate reputation. So there are four or five very important findings in this. And I'll start with one that the most important trust building aspect for a brand is to treat your workers well, which means to pay them well, to give them adequate protection if they're exposed to COVID or doing frontline work, to make sure that they have appropriate benefits. So this is not true in China, but across 12 of the 14 markets that we studied, this is the number one trust building aspect. In China, it's more about uh, environment. Um, the second most important trust building aspect is a safe return to normal work. And so those are what we call foundational aspects for brand. Now, the other ones that are more optional are sustainability, systemic racism, uh, treatment of, of women in the workplace uh, or, or in life um, and education. And so the question for brands is, so why do I need to do this? You know, maybe Mr. Guan's question before I spoke in May. And the reason you have to do this is today, this is finding number two, after quality, and price, the third most important aspect of brand purchase is trust. It's well ahead of something called brand love. Brand love is emotional and, you know, it makes Abby look like the beautiful girl and all these things, you know, it's all these image things. But trust is a core principle now that people are buying on. The third big finding from the study is the convergence of brand and corporate reputation. That you no longer can say that the chief communications officer sits on the left side, the marketing people sit on the right side, and these people buy advertising and these people do PR in the media. That's not true anymore. It's a bridge. And the bridge has two halves and they're interlinked. And so as an example, 
half the people told us, if I don't trust the corporation, I'm not buying the brand, even if I love it. That's amazing. That's a very big finding. We also found very specifically that when a brand takes a stand on an issue, let's use an example, climate change. If you speak up about climate change as a brand, if you speak up about racism, you get four times more trust than keeping the head down and saying nothing. So you need to recognize the risk is low versus the high reward. And I tell you in particular about this because also companies, excuse me, brands that speak up, it's seven times more likely that I will buy a brand that speaks about issues than not. Seven times more likely. So for instance, in China, it's six times more likely. In France, it's eight times more likely. In Germany, it's eight times more likely. So in short, it's seven times more likely. So the last thing I want to talk to you about, though, is complicated, which is brand China. So in our study, which we did across 14 markets, we found that there is a distinct detraction from trust from being a Chinese brand. And we asked why. And the issue is safety and quality. There is a big problem for brand China around safety and quality. Literally, 18% of our respondents said, I will not buy a Chinese brand. 31% said, I will try to avoid a Chinese brand. Of all the 14 countries' brands we checked, this is the worst performance. Compare this to an American brand, 19% said that they would either avoid it or not buy it definitely, like half-half. So the problem for America is environment. If you're an American brand, Levi's, P&G, whatever, more than half the people think that American companies ruin the environment. So the Chinese have the problem with quality and safety. The Americans have the problem with environment. And what I will tell you is the trust discount for brand China is equivalent to other developing market brands. There's a distinction between the German, French, British, American, Japanese over here. And on the developing markets, Mexico, Brazil, China and India. China the worst at 49, India 45, Brazil 35, and Mexico about 35. So one third of people will not buy a Mexican brand. But China has a big problem. So my suggestion for a brand China, we have to address the specific issues related to quality and safety. And I think this comes mostly from food business. It's a small business for you in terms of exports, but everybody knows about the melanine scandal in, in, in Chinese food system. I think also it has to do with the theory that the Chinese steal intellectual property, that they don't make their own ideas. And that's a very big um, deterrent to uh, trust in brand China. And it's not true, but people think it's true. So I think, again, I wanted to give you my most recent uh, data in a very honest way. Great, great. That's super imp uh, impressive. And also, um, just a quick follow-up question. Uh, when I read the report, um, I also noticed you mentioned the change of the focus from me to we when yeah. people choosing the brand. Yeah. Um, can you give us an example of yeah. a brand that has successfully, let's say, connected the culture, purpose, and also society to building the trust? Sherry, excellent point. In 2017, 2018, in a lot of countries, you started to see that nationalism and populism started to affect brands. And so, uh, as an example, um, American uh, apparel companies have to say, oh, 
you know, we don't manufacture any longer in Xinjiang because there's labor issues in Xinjiang in the cotton province like this. And that causes problems with the Chinese who say that's not so and there's a conflict anyway. That's political and populism. But in the last year um, with pandemic, we saw a change in values towards protect me, save me. Now what we see is a convergence of these two things in something that we call we values instead of me values. So example, making the world a better place for all of us is two thirds, one third is make me a better person. Another example, reflect societal values or meet a societal need is much higher than represents my lifestyle or makes me look like a cool person. So it's about we, not about me. And also, this is important, Sherry. We found if you simply sell functional aspects of a brand, example, that it makes my teeth look white, that's function. If you reflect the culture by having for example, um, Hispanic or black or whatever in the ads, that's reflecting the culture. You get a 25 point bump. So 27% trust from functional. Then 52% trust from reflect the culture. Wait, you get two thirds trust though, if you change the culture. So a good example of this is Ajinomoto. You know, there's been terrible anti-Asian bias in the US. A woman walking down the street in Chinatown in New York was punched by some guy. She was 80 years old. And she said, what the hell? <laughs> and he said, go back home, go home. You would bring disease to America. This is so ridiculous. This lady was born in America, three generations Chinese in America, but it's biased. So Edge and Moto, they did a program called hashtag take out hate. The idea was go buy food from the Chinese restaurant have it take out, and then you fight anti-Asian bias. And the whole story about MSG is BS. You know, it's so lie. You know, MSG is much more safe than uh, salt. But, you know, all these Chinese restaurants for years have been having to say on the cover, on this um, front of their restaurants, oh, no, no, no MSG in our food. That's a bias against Asians. And, you know, it was always hidden. But now we attacked it um, by having this campaign. Sales in the 2,500 restaurants went straight up because people said, I'm not gonna be for bias and bigotry. That's brave. Great, great. Thank you so much. And now, Mr. Guan, um, I remember you also mentioned about like uh, for the energy industry, we have some really specific and unique you know, differences from other industries. Do you mind to share with us, you know, um, from a sector specific perspective on this? Okay. Yes, the oil and gas industry uh, kind of has been demonized in recent years in the United States. And then I even heard some people talking about that is the oil and gas is the new tobacco. And even though the fact is the oil and gas industry is the industry that power all the other industries and also make the modern life uh, possible. But I have to say, after working in the U.S. probably 20 plus years living here, the oil and gas industry has done a lousy job in telling its own story to the outside world. And you may sometimes you may know that the oil and gas industry usually don't have the oil and gas company don't have marketing unit at all. So the oil and gas company produce crude oil and uh, refine the crude oil to, to, uh, to kind of gasoline. So it cannot tell which barrel produced by which company or which molecule refined by, by which uh, uh, refinery. So this uh, uh, industry is kind of uh, underserved by the PR firm and didn't pay much attention to, to the as general public. You only pay attention to its own shareholder, only talk about what's the production, what's the net income, but didn't tell what's the 
value creation for the whole society that I mentioned before. Even for a company like us, Chinese enterprise in the United States, but a personal average employee creation uh, for the for the for the society that quite significant for us. Fifty times of the U.S. GDP uh, uh, capital. So, so uh, I think for the industry, especially uh, third in the oil and gas industry, we need to think about how do we tell such energy's uh, story to the to the general public. Yeah, it will be uh, quite a difficult uh, task. But I, in this industry, I mentioned is uh, underserved. Probably a uh, uh, research company can uh, can. Uh, do more to help the oil and gas industry to uh, improve the image, and also for help other Chinese enterprise to improve the image, at least to the general public. Great. Yes, Ms. Edmund, do you have anything to add here? Oh, can you, can you hear us? Seems like... Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear yeah, you perfectly. Sorry, I don't know if it went down. Um, look, I think Mr. Guan is exactly right. Um, I remember this is a funny story. Uh, we were called to uh, make a proposal to Halliburton when uh, Dick Cheney, before he was vice president, uh, was um, CEO. And I go into Mr. Cheney, who's very intimidating, and uh, make a pitch about this wonderful merger he's doing and tell the whole story of oil and gas. and you know, how great Halliburton is, is drilling all these things for Mr. Guan and others, the wells. And I got up, I, I finished the presentation. I said, so Mr. Cheney, what do you think? He goes, that, that was interesting. And he stood up and walked out because, you know, these engineers, they don't care about anything besides turn out the oil and gas and all this, but you have to explain the centrality of the product to modern consumer lifestyle. You know, you couldn't have PCs. You couldn't have cars. You couldn't even have modern homes without uh, the plastic and other things that come from oil and gas. Um, and also that the industry has made a huge transition towards natural gas, which is much more eco. So anyway, it's quite an important story to tell. Great, great. Okay. I do want to um, relate back a little bit um, when Mr. Adam talked about the um, China has its own problem in PR and the branding. So is there any, um, let's say, professional tips or do's and don'ts for our audiences, considering most of them are executives from the companies investing and operating here? Well, the first is to do what Mr. Bond's doing, which is to talk to your employees and use them as the first allies because, you know, most of them are going to be American and they can speak horizontally. Trust is no longer conferred from top down. It is local. You'll remember local from my company. And then it's horizontal to, through the employees and, and through the communities. And so I do think the first job is explaining what you do and why you do and including your employees in decisions about why you're going to drill in the Permian or wherever you're doing work. Um, the second is there has to be more distance between the Chinese government and Chinese business. I realize that several of the companies will be owned at least in part by the state, but it plays into the whole narrative of the previous administration about how it's all China, you know, and it's, it's not, um, you know, the innovative uh, battery maker in Los Angeles, what is it called, B BDT or something like this? BYD. BYD. This is a fantastic company, but they don't tell anything about their story. You know, it's just foolish. Um, and so distance from the government. The third is, I do believe that there are areas in which there's such obvious need for cooperation. Uh, sustainability. There's a big conference coming in uh, November in Glasgow, uh, COP26. It's on the road to um, 2026, the, like the Paris goals. And this is a clear area where we are going to cooperate. And uh, I, I, I really urge all of you, lastly, to be involved in your local communities. 
I think Mr. Guan should be involved in, um, you know, Houston on issues of education or whatever um, for poor, poor black and Hispanic people. You know, you have to act like an American company in how you do your business, which is to say, be um, interested in the neighbors. It's, it's an obvious thing, but it's not obvious for non-American companies. Great, right, great. Right. I think um, Mr. Guan, no one special than you to give a brief response on this. I know you have a diverse background working in state-owned companies, now a Chinese capital, but 100% U.S. management companies. I know so you uh, work for a Norway energy company as well. So do you want to add some insights on this as well? Uh, yes, as I uh, mentioned, uh, this trust building is uh, for Chinese enterprise in the United States, it has been very challenging, yeah, especially for the state-owned uh, uh, enterprise. And uh, for state-owned enterprise, that big advantage in China, uh, that usually there's a household name. And when people see the logo, totally trust the, the entity behind the logo. But in the US, usually the general American don't know, the, the don't recognize the logo. And, uh, even for some people really know the name, probably under the current business environment, that's a kind of a negative uh, uh, impact. So uh, for the Chinese enterprise here in the, in the United States, especially stone state owned enterprise, how to tell the general public about the, who, who we are, what we do, uh, especially even though the state owned enterprise in the United States, how to tell the general public that uh, we are commercial companies, we are for profit, even though the, the, the maybe is uh, fully owned by the state uh, government, but still it's just a local company here in the United States uh, want, want to uh, 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 make, make money. So this area, this uh, company here, especially the top management with the Chinese origin, here I want to mention it's a, as a Chinese American that uh, I was born and raised in China, always been told to be humble, to be modest. And uh, here, probably not good at uh, self-promotion. Self-promotion probably is kind of against the culture after, even after living here about uh, 20, more than 20, uh, 20 years. So I think from the top management, probably need the, the communication iceberg company, just like a, a Richard's uh, a company to help overcome this uh, cultural difference. And uh, based on each company's uh, industry, develop its own story to tell to the general public that uh, here is a commercial company, it's a full profit that uh, make a positive contribution uh, uh, to the United States. So if I may have a kind of one suggestion, just recommend uh, probably year, next year that uh, collect, uh, ask uh, the top management, especially with some Chinese origin, to have half a day to one day uh, kind of open, uh, open dialogue to share experience and lessons learned. On how do we build trust and what's the uh, lessons learned best practice uh, something we need to uh, improve probably half a day to a day uh, internal meeting and then after that just invite the communica communication iceberg from uh, research company from other uh, communication company to tell us how do we build the trust and uh, integrate the chinese culture or chinese ownership to the american company and uh, divide its own every company's own story to tell to the general public that we are here for the long term and uh, bring benefit to the U.S. economy. Great, thank you so much. And I will make sure we put that on our agenda. That's our to-do list for next year. Thank, thank you, you so you. much. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay, now let's um, open the Q&A uh, question opportunity to our audiences. So um, here comes the first one is actually for Abby. Um, the main question is, is there any difference in Chinese companies' responses 
or let's say overall sentiment to Biden and Trump's executive orders. Both administrations rolled out series of EOs targeting China and Chinese companies, especially tech firms. But seems like companies and the market have less a panic reaction to Biden's EOs than Trump's. Would be great to know why. That's a question for you, Abby. Well, thank you. Um, this is actually a very good um, question. So first, I'd like to clarify that according to the research methodology and the manner in which the questionnaire is designed, our annual business survey identifies the key development trends of Chinese companies over the previous year, which means all the responses um, to the 2021 survey help capture the overall sentiments and of um, our respondent companies at the close of 2020. So with that being said, um, it should be noted that the data within this report, therefore, uh, do not reflect company reactions to the new administration, um, its recent policies, executive orders, et cetera. So um, while the survey uh, was conducted through uh, February to March early this year, so uh, after President Biden took office, we um, certainly saw some optimism towards a more um, predictable China strategy from the current administration, especially uh, uh, especially during the ex uh, um, exclusive interviews to the company executives. But again, the data um, from the current uh, survey is not sufficiently and accurately draw the conclusion that the market has a less panic reaction to um, President Biden's EOs. Um, so um, with both um, challenges and um, opportunities facing ahead, CGCC is also uh, working to follow up um, on the latest development um, regarding the U.S.-China economic cooperation. We're also planning to update Chinese companies' um, operational status for the first half of 2021, and we'll share the findings uh, once it's ready. Um, and uh, in the 2022 survey report next year, we will definitely have a much better understanding of the differences between companies' sentiments and responses to the policies implemented throughout this year. I, yeah, so I hope I have answered the question. Thank great, you. great. Thank you so much, Abby. Okay, so the second one is for Mr. Adman. About the Chinese brand, what part does emotions, politics, Ideolo ideologies play in people's preference other than quality and safety. These are issues that could not be solved at, at company level. Thank you. That's a question for Mr. Adelman. Look, half of America voted for President Trump. And I would say uh, probably of the American respondents, you know, we had mm, about a thousand American respondents, half of them are Republicans. And they have a very strong attitude towards uh, China and um, Chinese companies and Chinese products. Um, but safety and quality is a thing you can work on. Politics is something you can't control. And so the idea of being seen over time as being as reliable as a German product, for example, um, and as sustainable as a Dutch should be an aspiration of uh, brand China. Do the things you can do and also have better governance. Have the perception of um, an independent board and rigorous financials, um, and that will help you imm immensely. Great, great. Thanks, Ms. Adelman. And I think we have time for one last question. I will pick one for Mr. Guan. So um, our audience would like to know what are the Chinese energy companies approach in the market during 2019 to present? So Ms. Guan, can we have a brief answer on this? Okay. Uh, 2019, the market was okay, but the, the business environment for oil and gas industry has a uh, changed and uh, the access to capital uh, to the Wall Street, especially for a Chinese company, very limited. 
and the 2020 getting uh, even worse. So uh, the, not to uh, mention that even in the US, here since the start of pandemic, more than 100 uh, oil and gas companies and oil field service companies filed bankrupt that, uh, that's, uh, since the start of pandemic. So the business environment is really bad for the oil and gas industry. That's why I mentioned that I couldn't even right now have difficulty to believe that such entity could be recognized as uh, uh, the 50 year uh, company that are uh, growing fast and also best place uh, to work. But right now with a recent increase in the oil price, it seems the prime time for the oil and gas industry uh, not far away. Right. The downturn probably the worst already gone. Thank you, Mr. Guan. So um, thanks for your questions. We will make sure our staff follow up with you guys for the um, ones that haven't been answered yet. Now, last but not least, um, let's welcome Xiong Zhang, EY US partner and American China Overseeing Investment Network leader to deliver the closing remark. Hello, uh, hello everyone. Good afternoon and I thank you so much for Mr. Alderman and Mr. Guan for the in inspiring dialogue. This year, EY had a great honor and a pleasure to cooperate with uh, CDCC on the 2021 annual business survey. We are delighted to see survey the companies demonstrating cautious optimism about overall US business and environment. And it's also a tremendous step forward to see more and more companies committed to investing in branding and the compliance, uh, demonstrating long-term commitment, commitment to the, this market. Since 2011, my team and I, the EY America's China Overseas Investment Team, have been focusing on serving Chinese companies in the US and Americas in our, in our 10 years commitment to this market, we have experienced ups and downs. We were fortunate enough to assist with some of the largest deals in the history and the witness unprecedented growth in Chinese overseas investment. On the other hand, we also had faced the tremendous challenges in geopolitical uncertainty and the pandemic. What a capital us going in this journey is the trust and the support from our clients and the business partners. As a team, we have dedicated our time, energy, passion to this market. Our commitment will continue as we are living our purpose of building a better working world. Through strengthening cooperation between the US Chinese business communities, building trust and generating economic growth. In uncertain time, uh, purpose is what keeps us uh, anchored and what keep us fa uh, faster, nimble, and uh, more uh, 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 agile. Our common goal to strengthen US-Chinese business relation also bonded us with the CGCC and many uh, like-minded fellow CGCC members. I looking forward to continuing this journey and driving our purposes forward. Once again, it's been a uh, absolutely pleasure working with CGCC on the annual business survey. Huge shout out to my team member, to EY, their contribution uh, and the countless nights of the hard work. Please also join me to express our most sincere gratitude to CGCC staff members for their dedication and the hard work. Thank you all for joining us today. I hope you will enjoy the report. Let's work in together to build a better working world. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks to the UI American team. Your hard work and the dedication helped make this year's report another great success. The full survey report is accessible on our website now. 
and you can also find the link in the chat box. We encourage you to visit our website, follow us on social media, and subscribe to our daily newsletter to connect with us. We'd love to hear from you, so please help us to fill out the short survey when you uh, log out. You will just pop up on your screen. Again, a big thank you to all our wonderful speakers today. Thank you guys so much for taking the time with us this afternoon. And thanks again for joining us. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.